Good morning, Harvest. We'll begin our service in just a bit. But before we get started, we wanted to remind you that part of our worship today is taking communion together in our first Harvest at Home Communion. As we gather together virtually, we are still celebrating being one body through the sacrament. Feel free to use elements that you have on hand, bread, crackers, vanilla wafers, juice, water. It's not the elements themselves, but the meaning that Christ gave them that makes this a sacred act. And next Sunday, we'll be back in our building worshiping together in person. We will be providing the link to register for seats early this week, both through Facebook and through our homepage. This link will also explain our expectations for being present in our building in a safe manner. At the same time, we will continue to stream our services online for those that desire to stay home. If you are interested in serving in any capacity on our reopening team, please contact our associate pastor, Megan Byers. And as we continue to look forward, we have a youth ministry summer kickoff opportunity coming up this week. Our youth leaders, DJ and Jill, will be hanging out at Typhoon, Texas on Tuesday, June 9th from 12 to 4, and they welcome all middle school and high schoolers to come hang out with them. Your own transportation is required for this outing, but information about caravanning, as well as a link to purchase your own tickets, can be found through the events link on our homepage. Just click the Typhoon, Texas event. And for our Harvest Kids, it's time to grab your hard hat and your tool belt. Our virtual VBS this year will be a fun time to explore a world of concrete and cranes, rivets and rebar, bulldozers and backhoes, as our kids learn how to build their faith on Jesus. So make plans to join us online July 13th through 17th. You can find all the information for the full week of VBS at harvestumc.org slash VBS. So grab your coffee or your Bible and don't forget those communion elements because worship is starting right now. Praise today. Let praise be the weapon that silences the enemy. Let praise be the weapon that conquers all anxiety. Let it rise. Let praise arise. We sing your name in the dark and it changes.
so excited you're here with us in worship today. And as we come together, we want to look to God. We want to recognize that God is the holder of all wisdom, all goodness, and all peace. That he reigns over every situation, and that we can look to him, we can trust in him. So I, would, I just want to pray that as we, as we experience worship together, that we would truly just take deep breaths. Breathing out anxiety, breathing in the spirit today. God, we look to you. Would you give us wisdom? Would you grant us peace? God, would you give us love for our neighbor? And would you show us that you are in control, we pray. God, I look to you, I won't be overwhelmed. Give me vision to see things like you do. God, I look to you, you're where my help comes from. Give me wisdom, you know just what to do. God, I look to you, I won't be overwhelmed, give me vision to see things like you do, God, I look to you, you're where my help comes from, give me wisdom, you know just what to do. Forever, oh. 
with me in prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, holy is your name. Oh God, we honor you and we praise you. And God, we glorify you. Oh God, we come to you 
no particular shape, form, or fashion, but just to, to love on you and for you to love on us. Heavenly Father, we are a broken people. Father, we've fallen short so many times, but God, you've always been there to pick us up. Oh God, we rely on you and only you. No other place our help come from. Father, we look into the hills which come in our help. Oh God, we thank you for being ever so present. Father, we thank you for the breath, very breath that we breathe. Father, we thank you for the provisions that you've provided. And God, we thank you. Father, someone said if it's like having sands on the, on the seashore, there's not a number of times that we can thank you. But God, right now, we need you. Father, someone said that you are, you're a great physician. Father, there's a healing need to be taking place in the world, in our nation, in our homes, in our churches, in ourselves. Oh God, we just thank you. Father, we ask that your Holy Spirit come upon us. Place our feet on a solid ground. Regulate our minds. Purify our hearts. Father, bless every home. Let it be a home of peace love and understanding bless this church bless the leadership oh God we just thank you Father as we pray the prayer that your darling son taught his disciples saying our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven and give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever amen this morning i want to begin with a scripture from colossians the third chapter, verses 5 through 14. Will you join with me in the reading of the Scripture? Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. On the account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the, the image of its creator." Here, there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, you must also forgive one another. 
And above all of these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. That's the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. In a world that's seemingly desperate to divide us, God is trying to unite us, to shine a light on our unity in Christ. This week has been both tragic and encouraging. It has demonstrated great division and emerging unity. As the scripture described it as a taking off of an old self and putting on of a new one, nothing has been completed, but things have started. We're going to take a week away from Philippians this week to address what's on many of your hearts and minds. I want to talk about race and racism and the church, both followers of Christ individually and us as a church community. And as we begin this conversation together, I want to start... um, by asking for your grace this morning. This morning will be a little bit different. It'll be more testimonial. I want to share with you what God's doing in my life and in my heart. I don't expect that everyone will agree with everything I say, and and that's okay. We're in different places. But as your pastor, I want to let you know what God's doing in me. I'm also going to ask your grace today that although I have quite a bit of well-earned gray hair, I am still learning, and I am growing, and still seeing things with new eyes. Now, you might be asking to yourself, what does this white guy have to say about race and racism? And if you're saying that, let me just say amen. I agree. Please know that I have been hesitant. Um to speak on this, not because I don't believe racism is a problem, but because I did not think I was the right voice. And I was on the phone visiting with one of my friends and African-American colleagues. They challenged me. They said, Jeff, you're the pastor. You're the leader. Others may speak, but you must speak first. So it's with humility that I come before you. Because honestly, that didn't really assuage much of my anxiety because there are things that uh, cause me pause. And the fact is that I don't really know what to say. I am who I am. I'm white, I'm male, and I grew up living some version of the middle class American dream. I have not experienced racism. And I don't pretend to know what that's like. I don't come with any easy answers. I have have pause because I don't want to hurt anybody. There's so much pain around this issue. I don't want to misspeak. I don't want to be misunderstood. I don't want my uh, words to be misconstrued. I mean, we all know in this tense timing that One poorly worded sentence can get you in some pretty deep trouble. I don't know if one more talk will do much good. There have been statements and statements about statements, and and everybody seems to be throwing their words into the mix. And what we really need is intentional action. Finally, I have to take pause because... By addressing this, it's going to require confession, repentance, and change for myself and and challenging others. And not everybody likes to be challenged. So why would I do this? Why would we talk about racism? Well, first, because I believe that structural and overt racism is ubiquitous. It is ungodly, and God wants to open our eyes to something better and bring healing. 
because I believe that there is a movement of the Spirit and there is a chance for real change. Because I am convinced that racism is not merely a social issue, but it is a kingdom of God issue. And because the church once led on this issue, and I believe we could do it again. So let's start by just looking at what does the Bible say about humanity and race? And I think one of the best ways to, to look at really any subject matter is to look at it in a theological framework. And we've done this in the past, but the, we'll use the theological framework of, of creation, the fall, redemption, and restoration. Now, creation is that God created all things according to his plan, as they were intended to be. The fall um, was the introduction of sin. It is the brokenness and division and corruption infused in our world. Our relationship with God and one another's have been marred. In redemption, we look at how Jesus came to show the way. What did he do? How did he live? And the way that he provided for us to be able to restore those relationships. And restoration is when the time is right, Jesus will return and he will put all things to right in a new heaven and a new earth and the way things were intended to be once again. When we look at humanity and race in those categories, what do we see? First, let's look at the created order. God created humanity, all of it, with love. Genesis 1.27 says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. We all come from a common lineage, Adam and Eve, Noah after the flood. We come from God's creation. John writes in, in John 3, For God so loved the world, the cosmos, that he gave his Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his love into the world to condemn it, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Hear that, the world, the world, the world. This, John could have used a lot of words. He could have used the Jews, but he didn't say that. He said the world. All of us are loved by God enough that he sent his son. But that's not the world we live in. We live in a world of brokenness, of the fall. In Genesis 3, we see the introduction of sin into the world. And it's what, you know, when I read in Colossians this morning, it's what the earth, uh, scripture calls what is earthy in you. I love that. It's a great description of the things that are in us that are earthy, that are not of God. That God does not, didn't have in his created order. And we'll see that it's not in the restoration, but we live with them now. Selfishness, greed, pride, impurity, evil desire, racism. At its core, racism is the perpetuation that the humanness, the character, the attributes, the gifts, the abilities of one ethnicity, one race, are better than others. The idea of inferiority and superiority. Can you hear the earthiness in that description? So what did Jesus do when he showed up? What was the redemption like in the life of Christ? Now, Jesus was a specific ethnicity, and religion, but he repeatedly and intentionally crossed barriers of discrimination and teaches his followers to do the same. He interacts 
and bring salvation to a Samaritan woman in her community. He ministered to those who showed up regardless of their ethnicity. He even heals the child of a Roman soldier. At the end of his ministry, when he was about ready to go back to heaven, he he sends his followers out. And what does he say? Hey, start in Jerusalem, and then in Judea, and then Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. They are not limited by nationality or ethnicity. In a vision uh, in the early church, Peter uh, is shown that, that they should not, he should not think of one group as better than any other group. Acts 10, 28, he says this, and he said to them, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate or visit with anyone of another nation, but, but God has shown me I should not call any person common or unclean. Paul taught the same thing, that we all have one God and one Father, that the old ways of classifying people were superseded by our unity in Christ, that I read this morning that we are in Christ, and it's all about Christ. In Romans 10, he writes, there is no distinction between Greek and Jew. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. He writes again in Galatians, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Jesus. There is one voice throughout the New Testament, throughout the writing, throughout the the life of Jesus, throughout the writings of Peter and Paul. And what does it say about the restoration? What does it say that when when Jesus when God comes Jesus comes back and God makes all things right and he reestablishes his creative order, what would that look like? Well, we have to go to Revelation, to the uh, words of John, as he writes in Revelation 7, 9. After this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation and all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white, with palm branches in their hands. It is a picture of unity. It's a picture, a glimpse of what God would have. See, I believe the church is the visionary community of the kingdom of God. And what I mean by that is the church is where the kingdom of God shows up first. I know I say this a lot, but I mean it deeply. The prayer that Jesus taught us is not just something to memorize and repeat. It's something to live into and live up to. So often I say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Eventually we'll go to heaven. Eventually that restoration will take place. But in the meantime, we are called to bring heaven to earth. John in Revelation gives us that glimpse where we see the banquet the gathering of friends from every tribe and nation and ethnicity and language, not divided by race, not divided by social economic levels, not divided by uh, education. No, just standing before God in Christ. How can we make that more of reality here? The church as the visionary community of the kingdom of God. Well, first, uh, this week, I had to do a little soul searching. I want to encourage you to do the same. I I, kind of did this mental image of 
you know when you go to the mall or you go to a, a theme park or somewhere and they've got those big maps you look at, and there's usually a red arrow that says, you are here, okay? Because uh, in order to get to where you want to go, you need to know where you're starting from. You need to be oriented in that. So I ask the question, where am I on this issue? And I want to ask you the same question. Not your aspirational answer, but where, what do you really believe? How has your first formation, the way you were raised, the, the things that you've been taught, your experiences, how has it impacted you on this? Not just what you were taught, but also what you caught. And how has your faith impacted you? I just want to tell you a little bit about my background and where, where I came from. Many of you knew I grew up in Ohio. I grew up in a small town in southwest Ohio, which was part suburbs and, and part agricultural village. Um, and... And where I grew up, the minorities were the Catholics. From the time I entered kindergarten to the time I finished my sophomore year, I did not go to school or have a friendship with a single person of color. I I did not have a teacher. I did not have a principal. I do not remember a single person of color being in my church. Now, I could be wrong, um, but that's what I remember. But I will tell you this, that I probably had meaningful, meaningful conversations with African Americans for less than a handful of times, and I probably don't need all my fingers. My grandfather uh, was a great person of faith, probably the best Christian I've ever known and certainly a prayer warrior. Now, he left uh, school in the sixth grade to become a coal miner to take care of his family in Appalachia. Later, when he moved, when the mines closed and they moved to southern Ohio, he loaded cement blocks on a truck at a cement block factory. I remember him having an African-American friend that he he spoke highly of, that he cared for deeply. I also remember his vocabulary being incredibly politically incorrect. My mom would often say, now you don't repeat that. You don't say those words. He was a product of his time, of his education, of his culture. But it was part of my upbringing. What is taught and caught. The day after my sophomore year of high school, we moved from Tip City to Brownsville, Texas. Now, I don't know how many Anglos there were in my class. I'm guessing six to ten out of 700. Now, I will tell you this, that that my football team, the linemen that I, I played with, They loved every time the coach asked for the white dummy to grab me. Um, And we all knew that they wanted the blocking dummy, but it seemed to never get old for them. Now, I loved my time in Brownsville, and I made a lot of great friends. And I fell in love with the culture. But my experience there led me to believe that I understood what it was like to be a minority. A huge mistake. Because even though I was numerically a minority, I still remained in a privileged position. I had resources that most others did not. I remember those guys I played with and and those blazing hot South Texas two-a-days in August where we would have full practices in pads at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. It was exhausting. But I will tell you this, that I got to go home between those practices and swim and to relax and to eat and go back. 
where some of my teammates, they went to the fields to bring in the cotton harvest so that they could contribute to their families. See, for much of my life, I have been ignorant about my ignorance. I mean, I haven't known what I haven't known. I mean, most of my life, what I've tried to do is to have acquaintances and friends of different ethnicities. And although I admit that I sometimes have given in to stereotypical thinking, for the most part, I've done my best to see people as people, as children of God. In short, I have been doing my best to pretend that racism did not exist, at least as far as I was concerned. At least that's what I thought. Now I'm going to give you a little authenticity alert. More times than not, when structural or systemic racism has been brought up, I didn't see it or understand it. I didn't know what I didn't know. But the George Floyd incident has shaken me. George Floyd was was killed in my living room. We've watched it over and over and over again. I can't unsee that. And the utter disregard for humanity that I see on the faces of those officers that kneeled or stood by while it happened, I can't unsee that. And the pain that this has released. Yes, this event caused pain, but there's been so much there already. This event has done something that I've not seen before. One of the things that's really touched me um, are the videos of African American parents prepping their kids, sometimes little kids, in case they're stopped by the police. Now, some of you know I'm a police chaplain, and I, I love the police. And I believe m- most of them are gutted by this. But they feel the need to prep their kids because they don't want them hurt. Now, I, I tell you what, I have prepped one of my children, the one that I think might interact with the police. Um, and... And I, I told him, okay, when, when you, oh, I gave it up. It's Jackson. Um, the, uh, I told him, I said, be polite. Um, uh, look him in the eye. I also gave them, uh, I also gave him instructions on, on how not to allow for an unwarranted search. Or when to call the attorney and to have the number in your pocket, in your phone. You see, I prepped him, but what I was prepping him for was totally different than what they were prepping him for because in my wildest dreams, I don't think that would happen to him. I question his judgment, but I don't fear for his life. And this has shaken me. Because I have seen something that I can't unsee. And I've seen structures in our system that allows this to happen and continue to happen. And I believe we can do something better. Overt racism is easy to identify and condemn. It is the racism that we connect with white supremacists and racial slurs. I know that many Um, I mean, what I'm saying is I don't know many and maybe no people uh, that I think that would defend this or say it is right. Structural racism is a different story because it requires us to talk about our history and our cultural norms and our institutional practices that reinforce the privilege of one race over another. And these would include areas like criminal justice and health care and wealth 
and, and employment and education and so on. Now, I could quote a number of shocking statistics about how black and brown people in this country uh, don't fare well in these categories. They are at the bottom of all of them. And I might be able to explain how they might be in the bottom of one or two, but across the board? How do we explain that? And as I watched this week, saw a broken system. Now, I've said that my ignorance included a blindness of this form of racism, probably because the systems were set up in my favor. But a metaphor from a book that the, our bishop recommended um, has helped. And I just want you to hear this. It's called the birdcage. If you stand close to a birdcage and you press your face against the wires, your perception of the bars will disappear and you will have an almost unobstructed view of the bird. If you turn your head to examine one wire, of the cage closely, you will not be able to see the other wires. If your understanding of the cage is based on this myopic view, you may not understand why the bird doesn't just go around the wire and fly away. You might even assume that the bird liked or chose its place in the cage. But if you step back and you took a wider view, you would begin to see that the wires come together in an interlocking pattern a pattern that works to hold the bird firmly in place. It now becomes clear that the network of systematically related barriers surrounds the bird, and taken individually, none of these barriers would be that difficult for the bird to get around. But because they interlocked with each other, they thoroughly restrict the bird. Now, some birds may escape the cage, but most will not. So I find myself in this new place, this new you are here. As I have thought and grieved and prayed, I have a confession. I confess that when it comes to racism, I have been satisfied not to be part of the problem. And what I mean by that is to not engage in overtly negative racial stereotypes, to, to consider diversity in work and life as a positive, to make every effort to overcome the negative race lessons that I was caught and taught in my first formation. In short, I have done my best to do no harm. But my confession is this. All those, those things are not bad. They are woefully inadequate and spiritually, spiritually malnourished. When it comes to the sin of racism, real change can only occur when one moves from not being part of the problem to, to being part of the solution. Moving from not being negative to being positive and with godly grace an intentional action. That's where I am. And that's what I hope to do. What are our next steps? What can we do? Well, I mentioned the first one earlier. I hope you'll spend some time with God. I hope you'll ask the question, where am I on this and why? Am I more impacted by how I grew up? Am I more impacted by the gospel of Christ? Am I more impacted? Where is it coming from? If you ask, God will show you. Because this is at the very heart of the heart. Psalm 139 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. If there is any grievous in me, way in me, lead me in the way of everlasting. God will show you if you ask. I also want to encourage you to expand your relationships. If you're not in relationship with people other uh, than people like you, seek them out. We will only be able to grow as we get to know. And we're in relationship and care about others. Building friendships with people different than ourselves 
can totally change our perspective. Today, we're going to take communion together. It is a symbol of unity. One body, one blood. We're all in this together. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, our hearts are heavy, broken. Please give us eyes to see and ears to hear where your Spirit is working. Help us to see every person the way that you see them. Break our hearts for what breaks your heart. And let us not merely say that we love one another, but give us strength to mourn with those who mourn, to weep with those who weep. Let your justice roll down like waters and your righteousness, love, flow like rivers of living water. Purify our hearts, Lord, and fill us with genuine hunger for justice, for mercy, and true peace. Heavenly Father, let justice and mercy begin, and let it begin with me. Amen. Amen. We are grateful for Jeff's words, for his humility and his willingness to share, and for his call to respond. There are many ways that we can respond, some of which he's already mentioned, but if you are at a loss and you're looking for more ways, uh, feel free to reach out to me. I am happy to be a resource to you, and I know others are as well. But as he mentioned, communion is one. Uh, and as many of you know, we have uh, a tradition of having communion on the first Sunday of every month. And we have refrained from doing that in the midst of the pandemic because we did not believe that we could do that safely. The Eucharist is also a communal sacrament. And so it's something that we share in together when we are physically present, just as the elements are physically present. But we think that so many of us are struggling with this feeling of spiritual hunger and thirst, and we are aching for the communion of the body of Christ. And so we thought that though imperfect, this could be a way for us to meet that need, to meet that longing. And so we will share in it together, even while we are apart. Uh, and so Jill, in our announcements this morning, encourage you to go get the elements uh, that you have available in your house. If you haven't done that yet, we encourage you to do so. Uh, and so Pastor Hazel and I will be sharing in the liturgy together and then serving one another communi communion. And while we do that, we invite you to serve one another communion in your house when we get to that point. So we often start communion with these words. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and before one another. But in the last week, we've seen many ways in which we have not sought to live in peace with one another, and we have experienced the division of the church. And so you may have seen the pastoral statement that we released this week on the issue of racism. We do believe that there is racism in our nation. And we believe that our black and our brown brothers and sisters have been and continue to be oppressed and to experience injustice. And we believe that when we do not speak out about injustice, we are a part of the problem. And most of us have been silent for a long time. And so these may be hard things for us to hear and to understand, but Christ did not come to make us comfortable. Christ came to disrupt the status quo and to call us to deeper wholeness, to deeper holiness, to freedom, to justice, and to do that for all in our lives. And so if you are struggling with this, I invite you to quiet your heart, to still your spirit, and to see if God has something to say to you in these moments. And so I invite you to practice the humility that Paul has been calling us to in the letter to the Philippians as we join our hearts in this prayer of confession. Merciful God, we confess that we have loved you imperfectly as we have not loved our brothers and sisters, especially our black brothers and sisters who have been crying out for centuries to indifferent ears. We confess that many of us have at times doubted the word of our brothers and sisters and have been quick to cast blame rather than quick to listen. Unlike Christ, who gave up his comfort and privilege to be a servant, we have held on to ours. 
Father, your heart burns for justice and for wholeness in our lives, in our churches and in society, and we have not worked for and cared for these things as you do. We are broken, and in so many ways we are blind, and we ache to be more like your son, Jesus. Forgive us, Father. Free us for joyful obedience. Soften our hearts and bathe us in Christ-like humility so that we may receive your forgiveness and be transformed. Send us out to do your will and give us the wisdom to know what it is and the courage to respond. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, and that proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. On the night in which Jesus had the Last Supper and he sat with the disciples in the upper room, as they sat around the table, he knew that this would be the last meal. So he took a loaf of bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body that is given for you. Please take and eat and do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup. And after giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples and he said, drink ye all of this. This is the cup uh, with the new, this is new, a new opportunity for us to live, the new covenant. Drink of it and do this in remembrance of me as often as you will. Let us pray. Pour out your Holy Spirit, Lord, on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ. And may we be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by your blood, by your Holy Spirit and your, your Son Jesus in your holy church. Lord, just pour out your Spirit upon us so that we can do ministry with and for each other in a way that's going to bring peace and love in your world. Through your Son, Jesus, and your Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Now it's time for you and your family to serve each other communion. If you have others that are taking communion with you, will you take the opportunity to serve each other by telling them that as they take the bread and they eat it, to do this in repentance of any sins that they have committed and the God we know and Christ's love will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Megan and I are going to give each other communion today. Megan, this is the body of Christ, which is broken and bruised for you. Megan, this is the blood of Christ, which was shed for you. We invite you to serve one another as we continue in worship and surrender our hearts to God. Amen. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My Lord, my righteousness. 
my friends. I encourage each of us to look at Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24, as Jeff has said. So God can search us and reveal to us the things that we need to look at in order to change our world. Now may the love of God and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with you as you go out and establish new relationships and be in community with others that don't look like us. In the name of Jesus, go forth, carry the peace and love of Christ. Amen.